Welcome to our next lesson of reaching new levels of faith. This is class number eight on how did Peter search out his faith? I feel like up to this point, I've been kind of a ta taskmaster. I've been uh, cracking the whip, making you learn the five levels of faith and the four struggles of searching faith. And so far, it's just been a lot of rote work, but this is the class where it starts getting fun. We're gonna start talking about more of the practical application of what we've learned so far. And if I can teach you how to do this with a couple of Bible characters, you'll be able to go through the whole Bible and you'll actually see this stuff. Say, so, oh, wow, he's, he's really at solidifying faith or he's at searching faith and he's going through the practical struggle. You'll, you'll be able to tell this stuff once you get familiar with the terminology and understand what each of these means. And so I want to walk you through the life of the Apostle Peter as we look at how did he search out his faith. We're going to start in John chapter 1, if you want to be turning there. And if you have the workbook, you might open it up to chapter 8, as we'll be filling in the blanks and uh, be able to show you what scriptures we're going to be looking at. Remember, if it's underlined, that means we're going to turn to it. So the first passage we're going to turn to and read together is in John chapter 1, verse 35 through 42. So we see how Peter came to Christ. John chapter 1, starting in verse 35, says, Again, the next day, John, now this would be John the baptizer, was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. We see that Peter came to Christ with affiliating faith with a faith that was based on the affiliation with his brother, Andrew. He came to Christ like pretty much all of us come to Christ. Some kind of an affiliation, whether it's a family member, a church member, a, uh, a different relative or a distant friend or a neighbor. We have some kind of affiliation that brings us to Christ. Well, Andrew was able to re reach out and to bring his brother Simon, who later became Peter, to Christ. I want to pause here and just throw in a thought for you. Have you ever thought when you hear so many people talk about evangelism, we need to get out and share our faith, have you ever thought, you know, I'm really not the kind of person that just reaches out to a lot of people? Andrew, as far as we know, only reached one person for Christ. But that person was Peter. And how many people did Peter reach? You know, you may not be a Peter, but could you be an Andrew? Could you find one person to lead to Christ? And if that person happens to be a Peter, look at the difference that you could make in your world. Just food for thought. Getting back to Peter, there's a lot of things that changed about Peter. But one thing was his name. We see that there in verse 42. It says, as soon as Jesus saw Simon, he said, you are Simon, the son of John, you will be called Cephas, which is another name for Peter. Immediately, Jesus had a vision for Peter. He says, I, I see, okay, your name's Simon. I see you as, as Peter, which means rock. I see you as something being solid. He had a vision from the very beginning for what Peter could become. So Peter comes to Christ with affiliating faith. But he goes on to search his faith. And when he was searching out his faith, I wonder what struggle Peter went through. Well, let's look at some scriptures, see if we can figure out what struggle Peter might have had. Let's go to chapter 6 of John. 
In John chapter 6, Jesus is laying down some pretty tough teachings. He's been, been talking about, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me, which some mistakenly uh, believe that this is the Lord's Supper, but that really doesn't fit because when they hear this, they say in verse 60, oh, this is a difficult teaching, and taking the Lord's Supper is not that difficult of a teaching. He's actually talking about commitment there. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, unless you're consumed with me, you have no part with me. Well, this was a hard teaching. As a result, in verse 66, says, as a result of this, many of his disciples, notice not a few, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the 12, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We learn from this passage that Peter did not have the practical struggle. That was not a problem for Peter. He knew right away Jesus was the only way. He knew it was practical to be a follower of Christ. And there was never a doubt in his mind. Notice also that this departure of the many who followed in verse 66. A lot of people, just imagine, he preaches and there's all, a bunch of people turn around and leave. Why didn't Peter leave? Because he knew, he says, you're the only one that has eternal life. Again, he understood the practicality of being a follower of Jesus. And so that was never a struggle for Peter. Let's look at another passage in Mark chapter 10. We're still searching for the struggle that Peter may have had in his life. In Mark chapter 10, and looking at verse 24, it says, The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And I should probably pause and explain what has just happened. In our class on the struggles of searching faith, it talked about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, wanted to follow him. She said, go sell your possessions, give them to the poor, then come follow me. And he left sad because he had great wealth. That's the context of what's happening here. Now we're reading on as to what happened next. So Jesus explains it's hard. He doesn't say it's impossible. He says it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God because it's hard for him to understand his need and how he needs to put God first. In verse 26, they were even more astonished. And they said to him, then who can be saved? They think, man, if this man can't be saved, then we don't have a chance. Who then can be saved? Verse 27, looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. And Peter began saying to him, Behold, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much. Now in this present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecution, and in the age to come eternal life, of many who are first will be last and the last first. When Peter watched what happened to this rich young man, I thought, wow, man, he didn't make it. They assumed that this man would be, he would be the one. He'd kept the commandments, he said but he would not part with his money. Immediately after that, we see Peter saying, we've left everything, everything to follow you. What does that tell us? Well, the emotional struggle was not a problem for Peter. He was willing to leave everything for Jesus. That was not an issue. We learned several things from this passage, but one thing I want to make sure and point out before we move on is notice verse 27. I want you to see that if you are trying to attain 
a strong relationship with God on your own effort, you're not going to make it. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. It is impossible to follow Christ relying on human effort, but not with God. Rely on God for your strength. Still looking for the struggle that Peter may have had, let's look in the book of Luke, chapter 5 this time. Jesus is teaching large crowds, Luke chapter 5. Let's just start in the first verse together. It says, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. Now that's Peter, remember and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and he began teaching the people from the boat. Now when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and the nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and to help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to seek. And when Simon saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish, which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Now, we already pointed out here that, that Peter did not have the emotional struggle. There was nothing he was so emotionally attached to he wouldn't let go of. And we even see that again emphasized in verse 11. It says, they left everything and they followed Jesus. But what struggle did Peter have? Well, look at his statement in verse 8. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Peter had a moral struggle. He struggled. He, he believed that he was too sinful to be with Jesus. Here he was when he saw the, the miracle of, of the catch of fish. It's like it finally dawned on Peter whose presence he's in. I'm in the presence of the Messiah. I'm in the presence of Almighty God. Oh, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. That statement right there is, epitomizes the moral struggle. When we believe we are not moral enough to be with Christ. And I'll remind you that the, the thing that's hard about the moral struggle is the truth that's in it. Because none of us are worthy to be in the presence of Christ. But remember, we can't change ourselves, but we can be changed. And that's where our confidence comes to overcome this moral struggle that we have. Now... When Jesus asked Simon Peter to go out into the lake there in, verses, uh, in verse 4, he says, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now in the next verse, Peter explains, Lord, we've been fishing all night. We didn't catch anything. Keep in mind here, Peter is a professional fisherman. This is what he does for a living. He and James and John and Andrew, they're, they're all in business together. They're fishermen. Was Jesus a fisherman? No, he was a carpenter. And he says, I want you to go out. I know you've been fishing all night. Go out and drop down your nets for a catch. It made no sense whatsoever to do this. But that's what faith is. Sometimes it takes faith to do what Jesus tells us to do, even if it makes no earthly sense. And in your faith journey, you're going to have times where Jesus is going to say, this is what I want you to do. 
And you say, really? Yeah. This is what I want you to do. Okay, Jesus. If this is what you want me to do, this is what I'm going to do. That's stepping out on faith. That's trusting Jesus, that he knows what he's doing. And as a result, we see how they were blessed with many, many fish. But that was an important day for Peter because he realized the struggle that he had. It's another passage in Matthew chapter 14 I want to look at. And when we think about Peter and faith, uh, this is the passage that most people think about. It's when Peter walked on the water. In Matthew chapter 14, let's read the scene together here, starting in verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's a very popular passage. In fact, I'd read one time that this may be the most preached on passage in the entire Bible when it comes to sermons. It makes a very easy sermon because it's a great lesson for all of us, how we can do amazing things if we'll put our faith in Christ. But when we take our eyes off of him, that's when we begin to sink. We often laugh at Peter and how foolish he was to sink in the water. But think about it. He walked on water. Nobody else got out of the boat. Peter got out of the boat. And as a result, his faith took him to a place where he was able to walk on water. But he learned a valuable lesson that day. That day, Peter learned the secret of faith. And the secret is you need to stay focused on Jesus. In our last class, we talked about Hebrews chapter 12, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Here, Peter was learning that lesson. As long as he fixed his eyes on Jesus, he was fine. He could walk on water. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus and he looked at his surroundings, and it says in verse 30, but seeing the wind, he became frightened. Here's another important lesson about faith. Fear destroys faith. When we're fearful, we tend to do things that we wouldn't do if we're walking by faith. Be careful about your fears. Fear can destroy your faith. Another thing that we see in this passage is when we sink, Jesus is there to lift us up. As soon as Peter cried out, Lord, save me. The next verse says, immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and reached down and picked him up. So that's another important lesson for us to learn about our faith. When we are hurting, when we're in need, Jesus is there to pick us up. Staying with the same book here, Matthew chapter 16, I want to turn to verse 13 of Matthew 16, and I want to look at another event in the life of Peter and see something else about Peter and his struggle and his trying to grow in his faith. The setting is Caesarea Philippi, which if you look upon a map is way up to the north. And he's not even in the town of Caesarea Philippi. It says he's in the district. He's in the area that was a mountainous region way up north, about as far as Jesus ever traveled from his hometown of Bethlehem. And as he's up there, he's talking casually with the disciples in verse 13. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus wants to know, who do people think that I am? And they answered, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Well, those are obviously guesses. 
But this is what people are saying about Jesus, and that's what Jesus asked for. But then he asked a more specific question in verse 15. But who do you say I am? That's one thing if, if the common person doesn't know who Jesus is, but these are his 12 apostles. These are his close partners. They should know who he is. I imagine there was a pause here as they were like, oh man, we got to get this one right. It's Peter that bails them out, verse 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. He says, now you're, you're Peter, but upon this rock I'll build my church. Now the rock is not Peter. Peter's name means rock, but it's a different kind of rock than the word used here. And besides, they're not discussing who is Peter. He's asking who do people say the Son of Man is. He's not going to build the church on Peter. He's building the church upon himself. He's on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Now things are looking up here for Peter. He got the right answer. He gets commended. He gets the pat on the back. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. That's a great compliment. Look what happens next in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem suffer many things at the hand of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you're not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's interest. Peter, he went from the high, high to the low, low in just a few verses here. One moment he's getting the answers right and he understands you're the Christ. But as soon as Jesus starts talking about dying in Jerusalem, Peter, the Bible says he pulls Jesus aside and begins to rebuke him. Yeah, Peter's so spiritual now, he gets to rebuke Jesus. No, God forbid, this is never going to happen to you. Good messiahs don't die. Jesus, what are you talking about? You got this all wrong. Oh, it must have been very humbling to hear these words from Jesus. Peter, get behind me, Satan. He calls him Satan. He says, you don't have in mind the things of God. You're thinking like men think. See, he was seeing the death of Jesus as a, as a total failure. And if Jesus had been a physical Messiah coming to rescue the Jews from the Romans, which was that was the common belief of that time, they didn't understand the kingdom. Of course, the, the kingdom was so much more than that, and, and he was so much more than that as a Messiah. And his death on the cross was going to be a great victory for all of us, a washing away of our sins. But when we just have in mind God's things, then we see the bigger picture. When we're thinking about man's interest, then we miss the total picture. Bottom line, sometimes Peter was right and sometimes he was wrong, but his faith grew because he was trying. Another thing that we learn from this last, the end of this text, is that our words and our behavior betray whether our minds are set on God's interest or on man's interest. Your actions and your words will show whether you really are thinking about what's best for God or whether we're just thinking from a worldly point of view. Let me draw a conclusion here. When we look at the life of Peter, you know he was just a man. He actually said that himself in Acts chapter 10, verse 26, when he was speaking to Cornelius. Cornelius had bowed down to worship him, and Peter raised him up and said, Stand up! I too am just a man. And that's true. Simon Peter was just a man. 
but his life impacted many others because of his faith, because he had great faith. And you can go all the way through the Gospels and you can see the life of Simon Peter and watch how his faith grew little by little until he really became that rock, that, that Peter, that, that pillar in the church that Jesus had a vision for him becoming from the very beginning, from the first time that he met him. And he becomes, he becomes that great apostle who wrote first and second Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, a great man of God. But it started with a small faith and it grew and it grew, just like your faith can grow. Man, I'm so glad that we got a chance to, to share in this study today. And we're going to look at another character in our next class. We're going to look at the character of Job. And so I really hope that you're going to be here for that one. Thank you for being with us today and for, for listening to how to grow in your faith. I pray that this message will be a great blessing in your life and we'll see you next time.